Dominic Newton, joined by Will Miles. Welcome to Stand Up and Holler on tonight's episode. Will and I, we just wrapped up an interview with the coach who never punts, Kevin Kelly from the Pulaski Academy in Arkansas for years and last year is with Presbyterian College. Will's latest article for Four Bits, keeping an eye on the class of 23 and asking when would be the time to panic about this class. We're looking for those five stars. When would be the time to panic? And for six bits, uh, Billy Napier says the Gators will be aggressive in the portal. We'll talk about that. And we'll wrap up with what we'll be looking for in the spring game next Thursday night. Will, before we get started, how's it going, man? Oh, man, just spring game in a week. It's it's hard to believe that it's only a week away, um, you know, coming up on Easter, too. So, obviously, most people, myself included, can have some family coming into town. So, you know, get to overindulge on a few beverages on Thursday night and then be ready for uh, for church on Sunday with Easter. So, uh, you know, an exciting time to be a Gator fan. Get to see, you know, we've sort of been, everything's kind of been in the shadows. There's been the there's been increased media access this year, but not not nearly what we want to see. So, you know, is Lorenzo Lingard going to get the first carry? All those different things we're going to talk about a little bit about what's going to happen in the spring. I'm excited to see because, um, you know, it's been a while without football. So now we finally get to see some live action. Well, for the sake of the tight end room, I think we need to wrap up spring ball as soon as possible anyway. So a week away, that's not bad. That's not bad. All right, let's go on to two bits here. Uh, Will, we interviewed Coach Kevin Kelly. Uh, your initial reaction, we, we had a, we're going to post the interview uh, I, I think we'll post it sometime, maybe early next week. Will on the channel, I'll, I'll, I mean, we'll, we'll figure that out behind the scenes. But anyway, this is going to go up before the Coach Kelly interview. Coach Kelly is known for as the coach who doesn't punt. He was featured on College Game Day last year. He's been featured on many prominent interviews in the past. Uh, just a, a great guy behind the scenes too. But had the experience at Presbyterian College where they put up those huge numbers the first couple of games. Struggled a little bit in their first season, but uh, he and, and he is no longer there at Presbyterian. He's figuring out his next move. But tons of success at the high school level. Uh, nine state titles in 18 years at the Pulaski Academy in Little Rock, Arkansas, and gave us a couple uh, his impression of uh, a couple thoughts on Billy Napier's program heading into year one in Gainesville at the end of the interview. Yeah, I mean, it was really interesting to, to hear from a guy who spent that much time in high school. You know, what are the things that he looks for, the things that he values in a college head, co head coach who's coming to recruit his players? I mean, he had some really good players. I mean, you know, Hunter Henry and Jason King. Henry played for the Chargers. Jason King played for the Patriots in the NFL. Those are guys who were at Pulaski Academy while he was there. And so, you know, he's had real big time players there at his high school. So he's got the experience of people like, um, you know, Nick Saban or, or, Les Miles or Houston Nutt and those sorts of people coming into his program to recruit his players. And so, you know, getting his view of what's important, you know, and important to the, to the high school coach, but also important to the college coach and sort of that back and forth between the two. We've had a lot of discussions about Billy Napier and what he's done um, to reach out to the high school coaches. And one of the things I was curious about was how important is that? So we were able to sort of get get uh, coach Kelly's uh, view on that. And then the other thing I thought that was really interesting was, you know, we sort of asked him, you know, what's the, what's the end game thing that coaches get wrong or the, the end game thing you can do that really makes things successful. And, and uh, you could see him light up when the question was asked, he actually came mm -hmm. back to it afterwards. He gave one answer and then said, well, actually I actually have another answer for that. And, and the answer really was that, that there's not a lot of elite play callers in football. And at first I was sitting here going, oh, you know, that's that's something that Mullen, I think, actually did have. And we don't know about Napier yet. But he said not enough coaches focus on that. And one of the things that sort of made me refer back to was some discussions we've had, you and I, but also on Gators Breakdown, we had an offensive breakdown where we looked at Napier sort of charting out what kind of things they were going to do on the field, having analysts understanding what the opposition is doing at different areas in the field and what they like to do. And that was kind of what he was talking about in terms of being an elite play caller and that being the single biggest equalizer in college football. And so from a preparation standpoint, I think Napier is going to be prepared based on what Coach Kelly was saying to call the right play at the right time because of the opposition and what the opposition wants to do, what the opposition likes to do. So I thought that was really interesting to sort of, you know, I started out thinking, oh no, like, you know, we just gave up that elite play caller. Is that going to be a problem? But I think as, as he sort of went on to describe how he thought of an elite play caller, um, that really sort of, um, you know, points towards somebody like Napier, who's going to be analytically inclined and have that, have the, uh, have the statistics to back up the play calls that are coming. 
also had good things to say about Billy Napier and, and the way he runs a program and everything, just talking about some of the challenges of jumping up to the next level. But one, we really had an in-depth conversation. We got a little deeper into the recruiting side than I, I thought we were going to based on our questions that we had mapped out initially. But Coach Kelly just gives great answers, very honest feedback, very candid. That he does not he's not cagey about his answers, just very straightforward in it. Uh, it's a great interview. Check it out when it comes up on Read and Reaction on the YouTube channel here. Uh, Will, we'll jump quickly here into four bits. Uh, you wrote an article on what should Gator fans start or when should Gator fans start to panic about the 2023 recruiting class. Uh, Billy Napier, you mentioned he's fallen uh, the, the blueprint here, but there's still a little bit of work to do in this class that the 2023 class is only 53rd nationally. 13th in the SEC with one single commitment, uh, Aaron Gates, who's 276 nationally, but he committed last August, so not a Napier commit necessarily. You had written a similar article, similar article about Dan Mullen around this time in the Mullen era. You said you might have jumped the gun on, on some of that analysis. What, what were some of the differences you saw with where we're at with the Mullen era versus the Napier, Napier era in a similar moment? Well, I mean, maybe a little bit, right? I, I think there's, I think there's two things: is that Mullen had at this point about, I think, seven recruits, and they were all ranked worse than 350th nationally. And so, what that meant was, since those guys all wound up signing, that meant that he was, he had to sort of dig himself out of a hole. And Nick Saban kind of had that for his bump class where he had some some lesser players sign. And then he was able to fill out his class with elite players in that bump class. When you go back and look at that bump class, you got like Courtney Upshaw, you got Dante Hightower, you got Mark Barron, you got all sorts of guys. It's just Mark Ingram. You've got just a list of guys who wound up being enormous, enormous contributors for the Tide. But, you know, one of the things is, is that we kind of know where you need to be at the end. The question is, where do you need to be along the way? And I've heard a lot of people get a little bit antsy about Napier having a lot of visitors, but not necessarily converting those into commits. And, you know, we talked a couple of weeks ago about the sunglasses with the emojis. And this past weekend, there was the whole line out Florida quotes that all the staff put up on on the uh on Twitter. And so, you know, look, I think it's legitimate that people are kind of wondering, you know, we have hope that Napier is going to be a good recruiter or an elite recruiter, but we're wondering when that first domino is going to fall and when, and if that first domino falls, does that mean more going to fall? And I think the, the answer, when you go back and look at the people that I consider the elite recruiters, which is Urban Meyer in the SEC over the last you know two decades, it's Urban Meyer, Nick Saban. And I think you have to admit Kirby Smart is in there as well. And you look at those three guys, you look at their bump class, and what you sort of find is, is that there's a little bit of variation from, say, March until June or July. And then once you get into that July, August, September, you pretty much know from an average player rating perspective how good your recruiting class is going to be. So the point of the article was to say, look, I mean, you can't evaluate anybody in, in, in April, but where Dan Mullen was, which was, you know, 30th or something like that overall with seven commits was worse than where Napier is right now at 53rd with one commit because that one commit has an average player rating over 90. And if he just signs a couple of five stars, all of a sudden his average player rating is 94 and everybody's feeling good about it. But that you tend, there doesn't seem to be this domino effect, right? Where they're like one five star signs and all of a sudden everybody else commits. It's not the way it works. What you usually end up with is somewhere between, you know, 12 and 14 guys by September 1st. And you're going to look at the average player rating of those 12 to 14 guys. And if it's in the 92 to 93 range using the 24 seven rankings, you can pretty much be assured you're going to have a top five class. And if it's somewhere between 87 to 90, you're going to end up in the nine to 14 range. And McIlwain and Mullen both started out there, you know, McIlwain was at 87.9, Mullen was at 89.6, and they both basically wound up right around 89 or 90, which is in that, you know, nine to 12 range for their bump class. And we just saw with Mullen that that's not good enough. And so Napier is at a place right now where he can go either direction. And the question is, what direction is he going to go? But it's too early to be judging and looking at it and saying he's not getting the job done. The only thing that would worry me is if he starts bringing in a bunch of recruits who are ranked 400, 500, 500 600. And you look up at September 1st, and if he's got an average 24-7 ranking of you know 88.9, I'm going to go, that's a problem. But 
I suspect with all the guys he's had on campus with as loaded as we've talked about the state of Florida is, and with the confidence the staff has exhibited when it comes to these guys making official visits, including the fact that they are all saying that Florida is just different right that napier cares about recruiting that he loves recruiting that he's got all these guys in here pushing recruiting i expect the class to be really really good but you know hasn't proven anything yet but but it's okay to have not proven anything in april but by the time september rolls around there's some real metrics we can look at and say look when the ball gets kicked off against utah we're going to know is this bump class going to be up there with kirby and and saban and with jimbo or is it going to be a tier below? And if it's a tier below, then that's probably not going to be good enough to win consistently in the SEC. So it's why not Florida until September 1st when it becomes why not Florida? Like that's <laughs> what you're basically saying. Uh, hey, look, there's different process for all these guys here. I, I've been working on a piece I'm going to be putting up on YouTube on Car, uh, Cormani McLean. I read an article in The Athletic where his mother was quoted as saying he's got a documentary crew following him around. You know, checking checking out this recruiting process of the senior season. He added teams to his list heading into his senior year. He had narrowed it down to five last year, added three more. It's a smart move. NIL era. Go out and get your offers. Go see who's got to get you the most money. Now we're talking about the top defensive recruit in the country. Okay. So I to Will's point. I, I don't, first off, I don't think every five-star kid wants to manage his recruitment process that way. Some probably just want to shut it down as soon as possible and figure it out. There's probably plenty of that, but we just saw a five-star kid in the last week here commit to AM, right? Another defensive lineman out of Georgia. Obviously that's the rarity, uh, but most of the big fish, they're going to, I think most of the big fish will, they're going to take a little bit of time. It's not, you got to be a little more patient with those big guys and maybe see, the class build out along maybe the offensive line or defensive line up front, some of the players they want, but some of those five-star kids with NIL money on the line, do you think they're going to maybe take a little longer than normal? Are we going to see most of them extend out into that December signing period? Do you think? I don't Before think so. I, I think I think what typically happens is about half the recruits want to have their recruitment wrapped up before they play a game in the fall. And so that September 1st deadline is a deadline for Florida when the kickoffs come. And, but it's and also, by the way, when we say recruits, I'm sorry to cut you off, but, but when we say recruits, I'm talking, we're talking about the big fish, right? The blue chip guys, the mm -hmm. four or five star players, right? Yeah, absolutely. You feel and, that way about that still with the NIL? Yeah, I mean, I, I think when I look at the data, and granted, I don't have any data in NIL, so I can't tell you if something's going to change. I can only tell you what I think. I right. think what's going to happen is that schools are going to make their best offers, or the, I'm sorry, the schools aren't going to make their best offers. The the collectives and the boosters, the guy not tied the guy. to the school at all, <laughs> will, will, make the, will make the offers – early enough right like you there are going to be guys who want the decision made and are just going to say yes we talked a couple of weeks ago about the eight million dollar nil deal and sort of you know hinted that that might be for a school up north and you know that there are um the reality is is you're going to get an offer and you're going to have to make a choice and i think i think one of the things that's going to happen is the the it's not as though you know jimbo even said it he's like all we're doing now is the nil is out in the open and so it's not as though money hasn't been changing hands and these guys didn't know how to negotiate before. It's just now you're actually allowed to do it. And so I, I think in some capacity, I don't expect this to change the way the recruiting goes. I think there are guys who want to have their recruitment done by the time the summer rolls around. I think there are guys who will come on campus and go, yes, this is where I want to be. What are you going to give me? And then it'll get worked but out. If, I think there are guys who are going to say, look, I'm filming a documentary. I'm going to, I'm going to have this out until right. February, but those, those people were filming documentaries anyway, right? Like they were, or the, the people with that attitude, I think had that attitude in terms of, I'm going to take all my official visits. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to enjoy the attention. I'm going to, and, and it's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a thing, right? That half the recruits want to extend it and half of them just want it over with. It's just, again, I, I do want to stress that when I mentioned something like a documentary, we are talking about such a minuscule number of high school football players that this applies to. Five-star kid, was there like 38 five-star kids on 24-7 this year, Will? Something like that. So very small number of top, top-level recruits here. Uh, this is just a new factor. The NIL thing just completely changes how these kids can approach this. If you're looking at yourself, what percentage of the, of the five-star kids are getting drafted, Will? ballpark 70 
70. So 70%. 70. So that's pretty good scouting at the high school level to be able to identify NFL talent three to four years in advance. 70% of those kids are getting drafted as five stars. So you got to look at yourself. The smart ones are going to look at themselves as personal brands, go out to different schools. Why wouldn't you take that extra visit to Tennessee, get on the Jumbotron, try to work up, get followers on, on, on different social media platforms, really build your profile as high as possible. I think that's the approach you're going to see from a lot of recruits going forward. See, I actually look at it the other way. I think if you're a can't miss five-star, maybe you do it that way, but here's what I would do. If I was a recruit, I'd look at it and I'd say, okay, give me that NIL deal. And and ensure and guarantee it even with injury. So if I'm injured my senior year of high school and I can't play or I can't come to your school because you don't want me on scholarship or whatever, I still get the money. And that would be what I would do if I were, if I were a high school kid. Now, again, the legality of that aside, cause I'm not a lawyer, but that's what I would do. I would it's call use, it the uh, booby miles clause. I, I would, I would use an IL as a way of ensuring that I get money irrespective of whether I'm injured my senior year in high school, whether I'm injured when I'm in college, and then if I get drafted, right? And, and the goal is you, you're not going to get injured. You're going to go to school. You're going to get, you're going to excel and you're going to get drafted, but we all know that that doesn't happen for everybody. Right. So for every, um, you know, for every can't miss Reggie Bush, there's a Ronald Powell who comes to school and, and, you know, latches on as an undrafted free agent, but doesn't get drafted for every Ronald Powell. There's a guy like, like Lattimore for South Carolina who gets his knee mangled while he's there. Right. And there are even examples. Like if you think of Randy Russell who came to Florida, granted a three-star guy, but comes to Florida and then they find out he's got, he's got a medical condition that means he can't play. Mm -hmm. You would expect that one of the things you could do as a, as a differentiation is guarantee that money irrespective of that. So if I'm a guy who's about to go into my senior year of high school, I want to commit earlier because I want to commit before I play my senior year of high school. Cause that's my insurance policy. If I happen to get injured while that's I'm another in high way school, to look at it and you just Absolutely. build that thing in there. So again, I think they're going to be creative ways to compensate players for the demands and the things that they're looking for. And I think we all look at NIL and say, Oh, it's the guy, it's the, it's the entity that has the most money. And I don't necessarily think that's true. I think what it, it's the entity. And in many cases, it's going to be the entity that gives me the, best guardrails against risk, a significant amount of money and a significant runway to make more money in the future. And if you can combine that and tell that whole story, I think that can be more compelling than just saying, Hey, you can make, make 8 million bucks. Now I'm not turning down 8 million for 500 grand. <laughs> right. Well, I but mean, if, if you have, if you have an opportunity to, if you're a five-star kid and you want to go play for Saban and Bama, and Tennessee's willing to give you the whole bag, and Bama's like, "No, oh, we'll give you that. We'll we'll give you a, a quarter of what they're offering." Bama's going to probably take that approach early on. Well, I mean, we'll this. see, right? Yeah. I think that's I think that's one of the interesting things. This is one of the interesting things about the interview with Coach Kelly. We asked him about NIL specifically, and sort of what he thought that would do to the game, and also were there any sort of um, things that he would do to take advantage of it. And and I I don't know that any of us have a perfect answer. I, all I know is that every time I think about how would I use it if I'm a coach and I'm trying to get someone to commit to my program? I think there are a myriad way of think. There's, there's a, you can differentiate yourself in ways that are not necessarily um, dollar related. Or if you think about the NFL, right, you'll see a guy sign a four-year deal for $200 million, but 60 million of it is guaranteed. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so, you know, you can structure NIL deals that way too, right. Where you sit there and, you know, there's been discussion about deals being structured where, you know, Hey, you get an upfront payment, but then, you know, if you stay through your junior year, you get more or those sorts of things, there's like escalator clauses and, and all that sort of stuff. Again, not a lawyer here, but I'm thinking that there are ways to differentiate yourself. And hopefully the guy at Florida who's in charge of NIL and in charge of all that stuff is thinking about those sorts of things and can set things up to where um, the money can actually reliably be delivered. Cause that's the other thing is, is that, you know, the, the different collectives and all those sorts of things 
are bringing in this sort of money. Boosters are making pledges, but um, I'm not sure the money's sitting in the coffers yet. And so That's whether that another money point actually Coach gets to, whether the money actually gets to those players is going to be an interesting, uh, right. an interesting side note to all this stuff. And and you know, you it, just like any company, right? You get a reputation for not paying your bills, and nobody's coming. So um, you know, I, I think there are. And look, I think Florida is going to be significantly advantaged when it comes to NIL because you've got the fan base, you've got the booster base, you've got the Gator Collective, you've got just an insatiable appetite as we see all the time for Gator football and for Gator football to win, there's going to be full support for the program. And so the question is going to be, how do you use that in the best way possible? I think Florida will be advantaged, but I think you can use it to your advantage to get people to commit early who want to commit early. And there are going to be people who don't want to commit until national signing day. They've always dreamed since they were little kids to have the hats on the table have ESPN in there at their high school to, to put on the Auburn hat before they flip it off and put on an Alabama hat, you know, all that sort of stuff. There's always going to be people who want to do that and that's okay. Right. And I think that's what we see. Like you look back, Alabama in 2018 had 14 commits by September 1st, 28 national signing day, Florida in 2019 had 13, um, you know, 13 by, uh, September 1st and then 21 by early signing day, 24 on national signing day. So the reality is there's just guys who take time to make that decision. Can you move up one or two with NIL? Maybe. But I think when you look at the class as a whole, that's not going to be the case because just like you said, the top 30 guys are maybe the ones who are really getting the deals. Yeah. And then the money is going to fall off pretty significantly as you get to the, get to the high four stars and, and then the low four stars. Well, I know we get sidetracked on our NIL discussions at times. Uh, so for folks who are sick of hearing about NIL out there, uh, it's just it's it's radically changing the approach in the market. And that's even something like this with with Will's talking about with hitting some deadlines with Billy Napier. Like it'll be interesting to see how much NIL affects that and changes that. So it'll, it'll be interesting to watch. We'll we'll definitely re- you know talk about it as soon as we see anything. Uh, interesting going forward. But in the meantime, let's move to six bits. Will, you know, we talked about last week, the tight end position being extremely decimated. I, I, I saw an interesting quote in a Brandon Marcello article on 24 seven sports. It was from Kirby smart. He's saying we it, have never in seven years been this thin. And he's talking about how bad it's been in spring practice. And, and some schools you're seeing them really not even play their spring games. Everybody's doing all different types of things. But really, the reference was the reason a lot of these rosters are thin right now is there's a lot of transferring going on. So even you look at the tight end position, Florida lost uh, uh, Gamble to UCF. So Billy Napier is talking about on the uh, reverse side here, UF is going to be very aggressive in the transfer portal. And he flat out said as directly as possible, we need players. I I can't remember a time you see a coach say something so direct in terms of the transfer portal, Will. Yeah, I mean, so Dave Wonderlick has a good article over at Gator Country today looking at the scholarship numbers. Um, has Florida at 90 scholarships. I have them at the same number. Um, and Napier's talking about giving scholarships to five walk-ons. He's also talking about bringing in close to double digits in the transfer portal. That means bringing in 15 more guys. That means you're looking at 105 scholarship guys, which means you got to get, which means 20 guys are going to leave. So, you know, we talk about bringing in guys to the transfer portal and filling holes, but they're going to be holes opened up by the guys who end up leaving. And you're, and you're probably going to have to close up some of the holes that are caused by guys leaving and those sorts of things as well. So, yeah, we could talk about tight end need. Obviously that's a place where I think we need to add depth, same thing with wide receiver. But I think the other thing you need to look at is guys who are, relative older guys, guys from the 2019, 2018 class who haven't really gotten a whole lot of run yet. Those are probably candidates for, um, you know, for potentially moving on because they're the guys who don't have a lot of years of eligibility left. And they're the ones who are going to be buried in the depth chart and maybe asked to go someplace else. And it's a, it's a awful part of this business, right? I mean, one, the transition for coaching means there's transition for players as well. And then also just the fact that, look, at, at the end of the day, with the way the transfer portal is, when one transfer is in and you're, and you're at that scholarship limit, you're going to have to have one transfer out. And Florida doesn't have a dearth of bodies. I mean, they got 90 guys. The question is, do they have guys in the places that they need them? And that'll be the big, that'll sort of be the big question moving forward is, is how does Napier and company, how do they manage the roster in a way where they bring in the key transfers to fill holes 
but then also, you know, are able to manage that scholarship limit that they have. So I know there's a couple of big names out in the transfer portal. I, I saw Texas A&M lost a, there's a five-star receiver, a Dimas. He is under, he, he was arrested on a charge of assault for family violence in late February. One of the reasons why he might enter the transfer portal. I don't, don't know that's the exact reason, but that that's out there. So Texas A&M also lost a big time tight end, uh, Baylor, uh, Baylor Cup. So you're looking at, other than that though, Will, the wide receiver tight end room, Room, rooms where UF might need some help. It's not like there's a wealth of top tier talent just sitting out there ready for you to grab. I mean, there is, but there's going to be a caveat with all of it, right? I mean, the, the reality is, is that if the guy's starting in Alabama, he's not transferring to Florida unless there's something specific that happened, right? Same thing if, if a guy is maybe third or fourth string at Alabama, then you have an opportunity to pick him up. The issue you're going to run into is, is that he was third or fourth string at Alabama. Now, <laughs> the reality is third and fourth string at Alabama, probably really, really good. Probably a guy that you want on your roster. So then it's a question of fit with your scheme, fit with your culture. Do you want to bring in someone like you mentioned who might have some things in the background that, that impact their ability to get full buy into what you're trying to build? And is it worth it in year one to bring in someone who's more talented, but may not be a culture fit? And so I think this is why you saw Napier initially bring in guys like Cameron Waits, bring in guys like Osiris Torrance, bring in guys like Montrell Johnson, because he knows that those guys fit his culture of what he wants to build in Gainesville, maybe that frees him up to then have to bring in someone who he doesn't know as well, right? Because there's, he knows he's going to have the leadership in the locker room that he needs. And hopefully he'll have a better gauge on that in terms of where the leadership for the overall team is after the spring too. I think that's a big part of what he's gauging right now as he's going through this, right? You look at a guy like Noah Keeter who decides, yeah, I'll, I'll transfer to, or I'll switch to tight end because you need me a guy like Dante Sanders says yeah I'll switch to tight end because you need me like there's a leadership component to that mm -hmm. that I think Napier is going to value especially in year one and so you know I think I said a couple of weeks ago that some of these guys transferring to tight end might end up transferring out um, that may still be true but I think it's less likely that somebody like Xanders would not just because he may end up having to contribute at tight end, but because of the sacrifice that he showed, I think maybe he's going to want to reward that sort of thing. So um, I don't know. I mean, I can't sit there and say, is he going to value talent above all else? Or is he going to value culture above all else? Or is it going to be sort of a look at wide receiver? We're going to value talent more than culture because we need a wide receiver or at tight end. We're going to value talent more than culture because, um, you know, because we need a tight end, or is it going to be, we're going to maybe sacrifice a little bit on culture so that we can get a little bit more in talent because that's always the, you know, I, they're I guess, always going to I be guess my like point. That. Will is like, I don't think there's that. It's nice to sit there and think, Hey, go to the transfer portal and get someone. I, I don't think that wealth of high-end talent is there in the transfer portal. Based on what I've looked up and seen on the 24-7 sports portal uh, out there that they have, there's just so, not that, that, that high-end talent that you're talking about that, that you want to reach as, as a Florida Great Gator program, why you brought Billy Napier in the first place, to overturn your program, uh, overturn your roster to that degree for what? What are you trading? What are you trading out? Some of these four star guys that are going to transfer. You could you can bring in a three star guy, a two star well, guy I mean, that fits. Like I mean, it's not going to be so, a Heisman candidate that you're bringing in here. Well, so I don't think you know that, right? I, I think that there are going to be high level transfers who decide I've had enough after the spring, um, and those guys aren't in the portal yet. Because, I mean, we were all sort of surprised, I think, that Emory Jones lasted three practices and then decided to enter the portal. So there are going to be guys at the end of the spring who are in the portal. I mean, one of the things that was floating around Twitter today, I don't know how accurate it is, but a Jai Hall from Alabama, you know, a guy was ranked 45th, right. a four-star candidate, was playing in the national championship game after Alabama's top two wide receivers went down. Right. Um, I can envision some scenarios why he might want to transfer, given that Saban sort of ran him over with a bus at one of the uh, – at one of the – him and his, his – his other colleague there who was, who was playing in Alabama ran him over with a bus at, at one of the, uh, the summer stop, or I guess one of the spring stops when he was talking to Alabama fans about people being ready and those sorts of things. Um, you know, I know, I don't know anything about his background. I don't know anything about whether he actually is leaving. I think the he's Alabama a Florida program. guy, right? Well, so that was the thing I saw, right? So again, <laughs> I'm, 
this is just something that I saw. It may not be accurate, but my point is, is that guys like that are going to come available right. because you're going to have some situation where somebody says, look, I'm not getting the playing time I want. I don't like this scheme. Um, you know, you look at something like, uh, so LSU is about to have the same problem, right? LSU, Brian Kelly is going to start pushing out guys who don't fit his system. Well, maybe the guys who don't fit Brian Kelly's system do fit Billy Napier's system. Maybe the guys who don't fit uh, um, new Notre Dame coach. I can't remember his last name. Um, uh, Freeman. Freeman, Marks Freeman, you know, maybe guys who don't fit his program do fit Billy Napier's program. You know, you, you look at South Carolina, right, with Beamer taking over. Now, granted, he's been there for a year, but it, you get my point, right, that there are going to be guys who thought that Brian Kelly was the perfect fit. And after spring practice, go, Brian Kelly's not really a perfect fit. I'm going to go into the transfer portal. And so this you're is have- the darker side of the transfer portal that uh, coaches are going to use it to their advantage, too. It's not just all about – we talk about the positive side of the players having uh, some agency and being able to decide where they go, but coaches are going to be like, eh, why don't you go? Why don't you hit the portal? <laughs> Dude, it's a gray shirt. Like, yeah. you know, they, they, yeah. they, try, they tried like crazy to get rid of gray shirts. And what they've really done by, by introducing the transfer portal, and it's one of the reasons why they're allowing you to replace counters. So I think it's like seven – transfers that you can replace so seven guys transfer out of your program you can bring seven in without having to deal with the initial counter problem because what was happening is a lot of guys were getting stuck in the portal and essentially it was being used as a way of look we're going to bury you on the bench you better go in the transfer portal or you're just going to sit here on the bench and you're never going to see the light of day well, and if you're a player a covid specific role or was that no no so that that's is that's, that's transfer still, portal. That's still be effect. okay yeah the, the only thing with covid that expired at least thus far is the super seniors that they're still counting against the scholarship count if they're using their extra covid year last year it didn't count against scholarships this year it does mm. um but in terms of the transfers that still counts there's seven guys who can transfer out there are de- dates and deadlines and other things for that too um and then there's interconference stuff too like after a certain date if you transfer out of georgia you can't go to lsu or something like that um uh, but again there's turn over in college football all the time there are going to be guys who at the end of spring practice say this this doesn't fit me or whatever and they're going to go into the portal and when they go into the portal there will be an opportunity for napier to snap them up now i do agree with you tim tebow ain't transferring into florida this year right i mean you're going to have to find those guys on the recruiting trail and, and, and and obviously i'm exaggerating when i talk about you know high 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 end but i think a lot of fans it's kind of you just think that it, it, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side. It, hey, look, you know, if we get a tight end, that's the TCU's third string tight end. What's that? Is that going to change our lives in Gainesville this year? And that's what I, I don't know. But Billy, to your point, saying we need players, putting out a little advertisement for the world. Hey, if you're unhappy, we are looking right now. <laughs> Maybe a legal way to put out an advertisement. Absolutely. And, you know, the other thing is, is that uh, we thought we had the tight end position taken care of last year when Arik Gilbert decided he was going to transfer to Florida. Oh. And then like two weeks later was going to Georgia. So, um, just, you know, maybe the tight end is just cursed. The curse again, of Kyle Pitts. Uh, now, Gilbert didn't play for Georgia last year either. So it's not as though that would have been a panacea last year. But those types of guys with that type of talent do pop up from time to time. And so, you know, if Napier is as good as he, as we think he might be on the recruiting trail, then I think that's something that he's going to have to have to do right. When someone comes up in the transfer portal who fits his culture, who fits his, who fits his, um, who fits his scheme and who fits his, and, and who fits a need that they have, you know, those are guys he's going to have to go out and get, and he'll have an opportunity to do that. But I think, you know, yeah, the idea that they're going to bring in 10 difference makers, yeah. I think is, I think it's short-sighted. You, you might be able to fill, fill a need or two. That's about it. It's not going well, to be, and, we're talking about a lot because it's April. Yeah. Right? Well, and last year, last year's a good example, right? Or actually the last three or four years is a good example. You might end up with John Grenard, but right. you might end up with Tyron Truesdell. And that doesn't mean Truesdell's a bad player. It just means he wasn't a difference maker last year. Whereas Grenard came in and was an immediate difference maker. A lot more Truesdales and, out there though. Yeah, but the question I have is, is, is Osiris Torrance that difference maker? Did, did we already get him, mm-hmm. right? Is Cameron Waits potentially going to be a difference maker? Like the guys that, that, that Napier already knew who we already brought in may be those guys. And so then all we're looking for is depth, right? So that if, if uh, you know, 
if Jonathan Odom and Nick Outsness aren't back in time for the season because of their injuries, and if Toby, Tony Livingston, Hayden Hansen, and Arliss Boardingham can't get up to speed on the scheme, and if, you know, let's say, God, heaven forbid, there's another injury at the tight end position, like, what do you do? Like, you're going to need depth at that position, and just a guy who can block even though he's not a difference maker, just a guy who can block and run your scheme becomes very, very important. And so, um, you know, I, I like, I, I think Adam Schuler is maybe a great example. Like I actually do think he was a difference maker, but Schuler yeah. was somebody who got brought in sort of as an afterthought, relatively low level prospect, you know, three-star, but not like, you're not talking five-star guy comes in from West Virginia and you're like, okay, this is just a depth piece. And then they slid him in there against Tennessee. All of a sudden Florida's defense was much, much better. And Florida absolutely romped up in Knoxville. And then that sort of led to the defense getting better and better and better that first year under, under Dan Mullen and, and Todd Grantham. And so, you know, that's the other thing is you might be able to find lightning in a bottle with somebody like that, where, you know, we're going to look at them and go, yeah, it's a nice depth piece. And then all of a sudden they end up on the field and you go, Oh, they're a lot better than that. So, you know, a, a lot of that comes back to evaluation. A lot of that comes back to relationships. I think a lot of that comes to fit, right? I mean, Newkirk Valentino and Truesdale last year were, were solid contributors, but none of them was a difference maker. But, you know, I think we all also agree that the scheme um, had some things to be desired as well. And so hopefully with a better scheme and a better evaluation of the transfer portal, we'll end up with more impact players coming our way. Don't, don't say his name, Will. We won't say it. Let's move on to a dollar. Voldemort. Uh, no, I did. Don't say it, man. The spring game is next Thursday at 7.30 p.m. on SEC Network Plus. Um you know, I, I like the change to the Thursday night. Give yourself a little standalone event here. Uh, make it a recruiting event. Bring the students in to maybe have a little more atmosphere on a Thursday night. What are you looking for in the spring game, though, Will? Because here's three things that I want to see. Number one, stay healthy. That's always the number one thing in spring. Like to see some active wide receivers. I don't think you learn much along the defensive or offensive lines in in, uh, in a spring game. So I'd like to see the wide receivers be active against a pretty solid secondary. And will the move to Thursday night end up being a, a difference? Will it end up being like, are they going to do something that we haven't seen yet? Or are we going to – a lot of recruits there. Can we get one of those commits, the smiley face, sunglasses emoji? Maybe that they're saving that for a moment like that. Who knows? It'll be interesting to see what's different and if that ends up paying off and maybe becoming something they do more in the future. So I want to see competition. So I love it that they've divided them up into two teams and that those two teams are going to be practicing separately. I think that's great. I, I think you sit there and you go, okay, now there's competition associated with this game, which means I don't want to see Chris Doring catch a pass downfield midway through the third quarter. Um, you know, they're going to run, it's a running clock, 15 minute, 15 minute quarters. And then they're going to, you know, uh, 15 minute, four quarters running clock. And then I guess the last four minutes of each half, they're going to, uh, they're going to have four minutes where they, where they actually stop the clock so they can run four minute and two minute drills. So it's almost a real game. And, and I think that's important. I think competition is something that they need to make sure that they're enunciating to their players that when you go out there, you're putting something down on film and that we're going to evaluate you on that. And that if somebody younger than you performs better, that person is going to get to play. Um, I think that goes back then to the running back rotation. I'm really curious to see who the running backs are and how they play. Um, you know, we, we haven't seen these guys a lot, right? I mean, I can go watch some tape on Montreal Johnson. I can't watch much tape on DeMarcus Bowman or Lorenzo Lingard. So I'm really curious to see what's going on there. Um, I look at AR. I mean, he's, he's the hope for this year. If he turns into an excellent, excellent quarterback, then Florida's going to win a lot of games and can potentially push a team like Georgia because Georgia's going to continue to start steps, Stetson Bennett. And Bennett was kind of trying to hand Florida that game last year, but Georgia's defense was just too good. If AR gets much, much better and Georgia's defense takes a step back, well, now all of a sudden you got a shot in that game. And then the other thing I'm looking for is the starting corners. So one of the things that came up in, in our interview with Coach Kelly is sort of the value of defensive backs as teams become more and more aggressive throwing the ball. I think we saw that with the targeting of safeties that, that Florida has, has put out there. And then you see that now in this recruiting class where they're targeting the top three corners in the country and, and I think have some inroads there. So I'm interested to see. I mean, I think Jason Marshall is pretty much pen, penciled in on one side. You know, Jadon Hill, what's going to happen with him? Avery Helm, um, you know, Jadarius Perkins, who, uh, um, Kimball, Jalen, or um, Kimber, uh, yep. Jalen Kimber, you know, 
what what is it going to look like at that corner position and how are those guys going to play in man on man i think that'll be one of the things i'm looking for as well so you know competition that's the number one thing i love 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 that they're splitting it into the two teams and hopefully there's like you know win sprints at the end for the person who loses and rewards for the team that wins um you know because i think that's one of the things you, you don't give up however many points we gave up against samford while being a truly tough and competitive team and so, you know, bringing that competition back, I think, is an important step. And the spring game, yeah, it's a scrimmage. Yeah, it's for the fans. Yeah, you don't want to get anybody hurt. But, you know, you can't go out on the football field worried about whether you're going to get hurt. When you do that, that's kind of when you get hurt. Go out there. You got until fall to, to get healthy. If you do get dinged up a little bit, let, let's do some hitting and show, show people that the team's going to be tough. I know ripping on Urban Meyer is a, is a fun thing to do for a lot of people these days. But I loved the steak versus hot dog thing if you're you're sitting on old picnic benches eating hot dogs if you lose steaks are for winners like that mentality let's bring it back man let's get that mentality back within the program come on Uh, look i i and and you mentioned it and i think it would be really cool if they did it right if they found a way to integrate the recruiting and the commitments with the spring game. Like if you come out of that spring game, haven't seen Anthony Richardson chuck the ball all over the place and a couple of five stars having committed, I mean, the momentum, and, and this is, you know, one of the things I think we we've alluded to, but I'm not sure I've necessarily given Napier enough credit for is when he announced his staff, they basically announced a new staff member like every day every for like day. a month and a half straight, which meant that there was always something happening. It was always good news. It was always, well, what, the, what the heck is the game changing coordinator going to do? And, you know, it gave you something to talk about and it went, wow, he really, and you, know, you look at it and you go, how much bigger is his staff than Dan Mullins? I have no idea, but it feels like it is enormous, right? In comparison feels like the to what had there Duh. before. It feels like an army. Right. And so, you know, you came in there saying, I'm going to build an army. And then your marketing of that staff made that army real to all of us, irrespective of what the numbers actually are. I'm a numbers guy. I have no idea how much more staff he has. I can't go than, a day without seeing Bree Wade or, or uh, you know, Katie Turner pop up on my timeline somewhere on yeah. Twitter. Like it, it's the, the, it's the whole staff is very media savvy. They, they play it well. They've stayed in just, it's why I can't believe the spring game is next week because the off season has just flown by. I never think like that. This is always I always describe that this is the darkness of the year. The, the night there's eight months of darkness, and then you get the football in September. Hey, this is flying. I'm loving it. Uh, you know, it, it'll be it's always slower moving in the summer, but you got to appreciate the time before football starts back up when you can breathe a little bit too. So I, I can appreciate some of that, Will. But we're getting there, man. It's it's flying. Off season's moving along. Absolutely. And that's one of the exciting things, right? So, and that's the other thing I guess I'd look for for the spring game is I'm, I'm, I mentioned this last week. I, this is a time for families to start exposing little kids to Gator football. And so, you know, when they pan to the stadium, you're obviously, you hope the students are in there and that they've been able to jam those people in there, but also, you know, all the dads with their sons, all the, all the dads, with their daughters, bringing people there, learning to love the game, that sort of stuff. It seems like a small thing. It seems sort of schmaltzy, but I think that's actually really important that, you know, the, the spring game is different in that it enables you to do, to make that connection. And, uh, you know, yeah, it should still be competition. Yeah, there are things we're going to be able to look at. But, you know, my mom's talking about taking my nephew to the game. And so, you know, look, they've both been to games before, but it's always sort of been one of those intense things. This is an opportunity to go enjoy it and sort of and sort of have a good time. So hopefully a lot of people get that opportunity as well. If you thought you were going to turn, uh, tune into this episode of Stand Up and Holler and not hear the word schmaltzy, you were wrong. It happened. <laughs> hey, we're all here get- for it. Got to expand everybody's vocabulary from time to time, man. <laughs> That's what we're, we're qualifying that as vocabulary expansion. I like it. I don't know. I, did, I don't use that word very often. I, it, tell, tell Nick if you already knew that word. Give him, you know, give me some crap. I have no idea. I mean, I've heard the word. I just don't hear it used a whole lot, you know? Got to get, I was just pointing out, give me credit, Will. Take a compliment, man. Look, you get, you get to hear the word schmaltzy on this show. You get to hear me sing from time to time on this show. It, we are, we're a full service organization when it comes to bringing people entertainment. That's, that's all I can say. All right. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining another episode of Stand Up and Holler. I'm Nick Newson, joined by Will Miles. We'll be back next week to talk about the spring game. Go Gators. Go Gators.
Thank you for watching this episode of Stand Up and Holler. Be sure to subscribe to the Read and Reaction YouTube channel. Join our Patreon community at Read and Reaction for bonus content each week. And check out our website at readandreaction.com. I'm Nick Newton, joined by Will Miles, and as always, go Gators.